do is tell you a little bit about the TV Alliance, which is an example of what we call a, a nonprofit public private partnership, um, and then how we approach developing new drug regimens, a little bit about what's actually in development. Uh, I'll finish off with a little bit about our pediatric um, TB drugs initiative and then show you at least a few of the sessions that are coming up over the next three days that focus a little bit more on drugs. Um, and I'll just, one preview, because I'll be speaking again uh, Saturday morning, um, there's, there's eight to 10, there's two hours, there's just all drug trials of various new regimens at various stages of development. So as you've heard, um, we went 40 years with no new drug for tuber tuberculosis, or no real new drug. There were minor tweaks, uh, refinements of some old drugs, but until last year when Vidaculin was approved, you know, there was nothing there. And a lot of that was because, you know, there's no money in it for big drug companies, not a lot of investment, and the six, the four drug regimen for six months to treat drug sensitive TB, if it's taken, it's pretty effective, but it's still a pretty horrible regimen to have to take drugs for six months. So let me move on a little bit. Let's see, use this. So first of all, just a little bit about the TB Alliance. Our, our long name is the Global Alliance for TB Drug Development, but we refer to it as the TB Alliance. It's about 12 years old, and it was uh, started by a group in collaboration with the Gates Foundation that just recognized we need a new model for how to develop drugs for neglected diseases, and particularly TB. So as it says here, we're not for profit, and we're dedicated to the discovery and development of uh, TB drug regimens that are faster, safer, more effective, and, and truly available to the people who need them. Our vision, you know, the current treatment, and you've heard a lot about this, um, is at best six months of therapy for people with fully drug sensitive TB, and for others, an increasingly large number, it's anywhere from 18 to 30 months where the first six months may be daily injections of something like streptomycin. What is really on the horizon and may be the result of one major trial that comes out next uh, January in a couple of months would be four months of treatment. We've got some regimens with some good scientific data that look like it's possible to have a two month treatment Again, we're not there yet. They have to go through all the trials. Our vision really is to treat it just like uh, you know, pneumonia or strep throat, something like seven to 10 days of treatment. But that's sort of aspirational. It's further out there. And of course, the ideal would be to have a vaccination that everybody in the world could get. But that's even further out. So we still need uh, new drug regimens uh, in the meantime. Um, one of the mandates of the TB Alliance is we call our AAA strategy so that for patients, um, the drugs, any new drug or drug regimen is, it's, it's affordable, it can be provided to in very low income countries, it's available, it's not just, you know, here it is, throw it over the wall, but that it's actually, it's stocked, it's provided through the, um, the GDF, the, the Global Drug Fund, um, and uh, that it's adopted, that it's actually used, that it's put into the policies of the national TB programs and the WHO. And, you know, that's a big hurdle. I mean, it's one thing to sort of sit and scientifically develop a drug, but it's a huge amount to change the behavior of, you know, practitioners and national TB programs that have spent years trying to just figure out how to do what we've got now but that's something we're, um, we're committed to. So I know some of this is gonna be a little bit of a review of things you've probably heard since I'm coming at the tail end of the program here. But as I said, old, no new TV drugs for nearly 50 years. Um, the treatment is anywhere from six to 30 months. You know, again, very difficult in remote low income areas. Very difficult for somebody living in Paris here even. Um, complex, the number of different drugs, the interactions they have, the interactions a lot of these drugs have with um, HIV drugs, antiretroviral drugs, makes it you know very complicated. You know, if somebody's taking with MDR TB, multi-drug resistant TB, you know they may be taking six drugs for TB, 
three for their HIV plus cotrimoxazole to prevent other kinds of infections, you know, very easy for them to be taking eight or nine different drugs, and often there are a lot of interactions between those. So we need to simplify it, we need to have it available at a reasonable price that's affordable in the countries where it's needed, um, much more adequate, and I already said HIV, it currently often incompatible, particularly the standard drug in the four drug regimen for drug sensitive TB, the one is, um, rifampin or rifampicin, and it is sort of, uh, what we say, the poster child or the, the classic example in pharmacology textbooks of a drug that um, it, it revs up, it enhances the liver enzymes, which means that then many other drugs are, are cleared out of the body much faster. So that's, that's kind of a nasty interaction. You know, if you're taking an antiretroviral for your HIV and then you take rifampicin and all of a sudden your body is only seeing half or a third the amount of the antiretroviral, that's not good. And then it gets very complicated for physicians to know how to adjust the doses. So let me move on a little bit more current therapy and um, unmet needs. So for what we call drug sensitive TB, and again, I think you've heard this before, that's you know, 90 to 90 percent of the TB population, uh, th those are people that, um, uh, whose TB is sensitive to the rifampicin and the isoniazid in the four drug regimen. Uh, it's still, you know, six months is a long time. The unmet need is, you know, a simpler, shorter regimen, ideally without the rifampicin that causes so many drug interactions. For the multi-drug resistant or the extensively drug resistant TB, um, again, the standard therapy is you know five or six drugs for the first portion, say six, eight months, and then it may cut back to four drugs, but up for a minimum of 18 months. And again, daily injections for the first six months for most of these people, which again is very difficult. So, you know, again, in a low-income country for somebody to have to take a bus to the health center every day to get their injection, or have somebody in a community clinic go out to get the injection, very complicated. So pretty, pretty clear we need to improve on that. I mentioned about the HIV TB co-infection, and again, we need regimens that don't have these interactions. Um, latent TB infection, so that's what a third of the world's population has, you know, over two billion people where they've been exposed to TB and they got some TB bacteria sitting in their lungs, but quiet, not causing any trouble, that 10% of those people will develop overt um, TB disease. They'll develop the real disease. Sometimes we don't really know why one in 10 will develop it. If you have HIV and your immune system's impaired, you're more likely to develop TB. And in a lot of our countries, you know, patients that come coughing with fever and weight loss get diagnosed for TB, it's the first time they're also diagnosed with HIV. You know, many of them may have very low CD4 counts. I mean, they're very sick and they need therapy for both. Um, so we need better treatments for, for latent TB. You know, in, in the United States or probably Paris here, you know, if, if I'm, like every year since, since I visit TB clinics, I get tested, like a skin test or the blood IGRA test, um, to be sure I haven't converted from negative to positive. If I change and it shows I've been exposed and actually have TB in me, you know, I would take six months of therapy of INH to get rid of that. That's not done in other parts of the world. I mean, it's, it's costly and so many people are exposed. So again, we need better treatments for latent TB. And then pediatric TB, I'll come to that at the end, um, is neglected. It's, it's often not diagnosed. Um, children, you know, don't have the same, they don't, they may show up just as we say, sort of failing to thrive, losing weight, not doing well, sort of apathetic, but they're not coughing and they don't have night sweats. So it's often not diagnosed, and even when it is, the drugs aren't provided or even available in the right combinations. I'll, I'll, I'll go through that in a minute. So let me just talk a minute about the multi-drug resistant TB therapy, and this is an example that some of my colleagues in our office put together. Uh, these are columns that are, you know, three or four feet high, 
and it shows one patient, if you have MDR-TB for your whole treatment course, you would go through all that medication just yourself. So on the left-hand side are syringes for those daily injections, and then you can see examples of the different capsules. So this would be, you know, a six-drug regimen for one course of treatment. I mean, it's kind of mind-boggling to think of going through that sort of thing. Um, and obviously, if, as I said, if you also have HIV, you're taking three more HIV drugs plus one or two drugs to prevent other kinds of infections, like the cotrimoxazole. And we find that even when surveys are done, uh, you know, less, well, often only a quarter of MDR patients are even diagnosed or identified, and then it comes down to, you know, 10% or less are actually getting proper therapy. And the ones that don't, either die, that's a lot of the deaths for TB, you know, or they're passing it on to their families, their children, other people in the crowded tuk-tuk buses or whatever it is they take. So the evolving landscape, this is a really exciting time for all of us working in TB drug development and for TB patients that we finally got some new drugs. So um, as it says in the second bullet, uh, Bedaquiline, which is made by Johnson & Johnson or the Janssen Pharmaceutical Group within Johnson & Johnson, was just approved in the United States last year. We at the TB Alliance work to co-develop the drug, so we want to expand its use so it can be used in patients with, say, drug-sensitive TB. Right now, it's just for a fairly narrow group of patients with the, the MDR TB. They have filed for approval in South Africa, China, uh, I think India, you know, a number of other countries, and there will probably be some other sessions that Janssen may put on during the meeting to talk about that. But that's exciting. So that's the first new drug in almost 50 years. The lamina is, delaminate there is made by the Japanese company Otsuka, or Otsuka, however, I think they pronounce it Otsuka. Um, and it, they have filed for registration in Europe but they, they don't have registration any place, but they're working on trying to get registration. So that's a great first step, but the way these new drugs are used right now is to add them on top of the six other drugs for MDR treatment, and they get better outcomes in patients. More people get cured, but it's still taking a sick drug regimen with daily injections and adding yet another drug on top of it. So what we're really committed to, and those companies are too in the long run, is to have much simpler regimens that, that'll do the trick. So there's a lot in the pipeline, a lot of things we and others are developing, and I'll show you that, that in a minute. So you have a handout, I think, on your tables that should be, sort of look like this. Is it, it or maybe the TB Alliance one, which comes next. Yeah, I think I have a question. Yes, sure, yeah, go ahead. First, I need to confirm if it's okay with you for Yeah, yeah. Would you just go back to the previous slide, please? Sure. Is there any specific reason why after 50 years of no progress, all of a sudden there's so much progress? Is there a story there? Is there a pattern? That's a good question. Um, it's easy to say probably why there wasn't much progress, just because there's not a lot of money in selling TV drugs. So companies that typically would spend a billion dollars, U.S. dollars, developing a drug, you know, aren't going to recoup that. At Johnson & Johnson, I actually was there when Bedaquiline was being developed. Part of it was the head of R&D, Paul Stoffels, spent 10 years working in Africa, um, in um, uh, the Congo and in uh, uh, Rwanda, taking care of um, HIV patients and TB patients. So he just had a real personal commitment. And he, and then Johnson & Johnson, likes to be known as the kind, caring, baby-friendly company. They, 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 they know they're, they're going to lose money on it. But I think it was partly they were lucky in the lab. They found something good. And then people like their head of R&D just kept it going. Um, Utska, uh, partly I think that, and again, I don't know the story there, but the, the CEO has a real personal commitment to tuberculosis. Uh, I think they hope they're going to make some money on it, but I don't know whether he had a family member with it or not. So some of it's a little bit um, serendipitous, you know, by chance. 
Now, though, like with the TB Alliance and some others, um, I think we've got a lot more promise because what we're recognizing is for drugs, for diseases like this, or malaria, or Chagas disease, or African sleeping sickness, you can't rely on traditional profit-making drug companies to do the development. But what we do is partner with some funding from like the Gates Foundation, from the Australian AIDS Society, from USAID, and with drug companies that may have something good, they just can't put the money into it that needs to be invested. Um, and then academic groups like um, the AIDS Clinical Trials Group and NIH in the US. So we can leverage all that to get things developed um, in sort of a whole new way. So that, that's a little bit of a long answer. So some of it for the comp for private companies, it's a little bit of just a chance that the right people found the right thing and kept it going. In other ways, I think these public-private partnerships will help get things developed in a way that just haven't in the past, and they're only about 10 years old. Yeah, question? Um, is Bidacolin in phase three now? Has yes. Started? If Bidacolin was approved by a an, uh, an accelerated, expedited approval in the U.S. after phase two. So based on a very small amount of data, but because it's such a high need, the U.S. FDA approved it. But the requirement is it goes on to phase three. Now phase three hasn't actually been started because they're still negotiating with the FDA and the European Medicines Agency on the best design of the trial, but it will it will go through a full phase three. Mm -hmm. Obviously, if it fails in phase three, well, it comes off the market. But you know that's not likely. Mm -hmm. I think a lot of it is to identify the safety profile a little bit better. Any other questions on? Yes. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, yesterday somebody was actually you know in a press conference was telling that Bidacolin's price would would be around nine thousand U.S. dollar for a you know six month treatment. And they are also, you know, opposing this thing. Do you feel that you were uh, completely agree with this particular, you know, higher cost of the treatment? Yeah, I. The question is on Benaclin's price, and I'm not an expert on it, to be honest, since I'm working in research and development, and I can't speak for Janssen. My understanding is they do have different prices for different countries. So, like in the United States and Europe, it's the highest price. And they priced it based on, you know, what might be the improvement to MDR patients being treated. And then there's sort of middle price, and then for the countries with the lowest income, there's a lower price. Um, now, I'm sure countries will, as, as they approve it, you know, there will be different negotiations to get the price down. Um, and it, I can't say too much about it. In our development of drug regimens, we want to get out there. Again, anybody we partner with you know, really has to sign a contract that they're committed to affordable pricing. Now, to get a manufacturer in, say, India to make a new drug at the best possible price, you know, that manufacturer still has to earn enough money to pay their employees. They don't have to earn all the research and development costs back. So that's where we see, you know, partnering and anything we develop with a with a partner to be able to get it out at you know the best possible price. Um, but hopefully, again, the countries that need the Dacbalain that don't aren't able to afford it, you know, will be able to get it at a special low price. Another question? Just regarding Bedacolin, uh, also that. There was a death, but uh, this was long after Bedaquiline was stopped. Mm -hmm. um, was that the only one? Um, no, there were there were some deaths that was a little bit of a surprise, and this was all discussed at, at the FDA advisory committee meeting, and it's in their U.S. product label. W what it was is in patients treated on Bedaquiline across the whole program versus patients on the background regimen without Bedaquiline, there was an excess number of deaths. I don't want to tell you the number off the top of my head, but it was, it was more like 9 or 10. The thing is, a lot of them happened long after they had stopped the drug. You know, some of them were motor vehicle accidents. It raised concern because of the imbalance of deaths, but you know, I actually personally have read through the details of every single death, and it's really hard to come up with any good biologic explanation why the drug would have caused it, but it's something the FDA wants to be sure in phase three that it's watched very closely 
and essentially anyone being given the drug, at least in the U.S., goes into a registry where they're tracked very carefully to, uh, you know, the, the hope is that was just a, a chance, but as more patients are, are treated. How many countries are involved in the phase three trials of bedaquinine at the moment? I mean, in 2014, how many countries? Um, I don't know off the top of my head, but it's many. I mean, it will be 12 to 15, something like that. I don't know. No. You know, can, I, can we can find out. Okay. It's it's a large number. Okay. Yeah, and, and, and in all parts of the world. And when are the results expected to come out? Oh, well, phase three, it, it hasn't started yet. It'll start early next year, and it will probably run for two to three years, and then you have to follow the patients up. So, again, off the top of my head, it'll be five years or so before the actual phase three data comes out. What is the delaminid level about? We, we haven't heard about delaminid at all, if you could elaborate on that. Well, yeah, delaminid, it, it's in a brand new chemical category, completely different from bedaquiline. It's called a, a nitroimid azole, kind of a fancy term. Um, and it's very potent. We have a, a similar drug, similar in some ways, that we're developing at the TB Alliance. They actually are, they, they're, well, it gets complicated. Their phase two study only randomized patients for, for blinded follow-up for two months. So they moved <laughs> fairly quickly on to phase three, and they are about two-thirds of the way enrolled in phase three. So they're further along in phase three. And I think a lot of countries will require the phase three to be finished before they'll approve it. Again, I, I, I don't know because I'm not part of their company. So it's uh, one that I don't know when the first approval will be, but after bedaquiline, it will probably be the next one approved. But again, it will only be approved to add on top of that long, complicated MDR regimen. So how many success stories have we had at the end of phase 2B for bedaquiline to be able to be at least a little sure about that this, this might work and then go on to phase 3. So what are the success stories broadly looking like at this moment? What they looked at was showing that with bedaquiline, the time it takes for everybody treated on the whole to clear all the TB out of their sputum to be negative was faster than without metaquiline. That was the initial primary endpoint. What they followed up is to show that in the end, more people stayed clear of tuberculosis than not. And again, I, I can't tell you the exact numbers off the top of my head, but um, you know, at least the US Food and Drug Administration was convinced that it offers benefit, but again, this is only for that subset of patients that have multi-drug resistant TB. Why don't I go on, because, well, one more, and then, because well, I'll show you what we're doing. I just wanted to, so maybe to take the pressure off of you, there's two sessions on bedaquiline on Sunday with the most updated Good. from phase, phase TV trial, so At, can go and That's perfect, because that'll be um, <laughs> from my colleagues who are actually there developing bedaquiline. Yeah, and they can tell you more. No, so that'll be a status update on phase three. Again, we're not going to go through all the details, but it, this just gives the concept of, if you start at the left discovery, that's in the laboratory, the earliest look at new drugs. You know, in a petri dish culture, do they kill tuberculosis that are growing or not? Then you go through pre, and, and there are a lot of things there, more than there ever have been in the last 50 years. Then preclinical development and what they call GLP tox, that's when you're in animals. One looking at, so like mice given tuberculosis, does it cure them? Um, and then toxicology studies. So before you can go into humans, you need to look in, say, rats and dogs. You know, when you go to high doses, does it cause problems with the liver or muscle or whatever? Um, and then phase one is when you go into humans for the first time. And usually the first studies in humans are just in healthy volunteers to look at how does the drug get into the system and out of the system, which is called pharmacokinetics. Um, you know, does it make people get nauseated and vomit? Is it well tolerated? Then phase two, you get into patients. And phase three are the, the large studies, 
usually required for registration, although again, that ActCoin was approved at the end of phase two. So as you can see, phase two, um, AZD, that's an AstraZeneca drug that is in a small study just for two weeks of therapy. We talked about vidaquiline, which used to be called TMC-207. Um, several novel things. I'll talk a little bit more. PA-824 is one drug that we're developing at the, at the TB Alliance. Um, the one SQ-109, that's another different drug being developed by a company called Sequela. And I don't know if they're presenting anything here at this meeting or not. Uh, Sutazolid is a drug that was developed initially by Pfizer. And again, it's only gone through 14 days of testing in humans. But it's exciting that there's at least that group of things. And then a handful of things in phase three. So we talked about delaminids in phase three. In parentheses, the OPC, that's just the old sort of uh, laboratory chemical name for it. Then gadifloxacin and moxifloxacin are both existing drugs that have been tested for tuberculosis, and the results of those are just being reported and coming out. Rifapentins also is a drug like rifampicin that has been around for a while, but people are studying it at higher doses to see if it could be useful to shorten the therapy from, say, six months to four months. So that's just sort of a snapshot across the world and everything being developed. Um, this is just the TB Alliance and what we have in development. What we've also shown, though, is not just the single drugs, but for TB, you, you'll never cure it with a single drug. You need three or four drugs at a time, um, at a minimum. So what you can see is in phase 2A, NCO03, I'll show that in a minute, but it's different combinations of drugs, different regimens. Um, phase 2B, you know, phase 3, phase 4, and again, I think you have a handout of this material, so I'm not going to go through the detail. I, I'll flesh out a little bit more what some of these drugs and studies are in a minute. So, strong momentum and TB drug results. So, let me get on a little bit to um, some of the studies we're doing, these different combinations. So, there's what we call the REMOX trial, and that's just what we call an acronym for the trial. This is a study that's been going on for about five years. It looks at treating people with so-called drug-sensitive TB for four months rather than six. So what it does is it takes that four-drug standard regimen and it substitutes one of the drugs for an antibiotic called moxifloxacin. Moxifloxacin has been approved in many countries for a number of years for treating things like pneumonia, other bacterial illnesses, normally just for 10 days. And in most countries, it's very expensive. So you probably find in, somebody here is from Malawi? Yeah, you probably find it's not used very much in Malawi because it's so expensive, or Kenya. Um, but it's going off patent next year, so it's gonna be a lot cheaper. So at any rate, in January, well, the first quarter of next year, sometime January, February, March, we will have the final results of the REMOX trial to know is this regimen effective and can it shorten from six months to four months. So that's not taking the therapy down to 10 days, but if, if you or I had TB, I'd sure rather take drugs for four months rather than for six months. And we expect that to be an affordable regimen that will be, we don't know exactly what the price will be, but not fairly similar to what the standard regimen is now. The other two studies that we just finished up and are just getting the results of, we call by the, the numbers NC002. So in English, NC stands for new combination. So these are combination regimen studies, NC002. And that combined the one new drug, PA824. It doesn't have a, a good name yet. PA824 with moxifloxacin, and Z is, stands for pyrazinamide, which is one of the older drugs, um, treating both drug-sensitive and MDR uh, patients. And I'll show you a little bit more about that study in a few minutes. Um, the hope is that this would be a much shorter regimen for patients with drug-resistant TB and maybe a four-month regimen for patients with drug-sensitive TB. And then the NCOO3 trial 
is earlier, so it's a shorter trial, and um, we're presenting the results of that Saturday morning. Um, it's looking at some novel combinations, um, and the study itself was only two weeks long to look at how can you reduce the bacteria over two weeks. The next thing we'll do is a two-month trial before we go on to a phase three trial. And again, I'll give you a little bit more detail in a minute. So back to REMOX, global phase three trial. So this is looking at four months of moxifloxacin with three of the other drugs can, can do just as well as the current six drug regimen. It would be the first new regimen to, re to treat drug sensitive TB in, in 50 years. Because remember, bedaquiline and delaminid have not been developed so far by Janssen or Otsuka uh, for drug sensitive TB. Um, it also would be the first time to ever shorten treatment to four months for the drug sensitive patients. Again, if it's successful, we don't know the results yet. But it's been fully enrolled, all the patients have been followed up, so the only thing we're waiting for are the last laboratory tests on the bacteria before the database is locked and we unblind it and actually get the results. Um, this enrolled, uh, these are big studies, so it was 1,931 patients, uh, to be exact, 1931, 48 different hospitals and trial sites across nine countries. So it covers quite a bit of the world. Um, and you know, we developed a lot of laboratories to be able to do the work, a lot of community engagement, participation. You can see the, this was probably on National TB Day, a March, Last year, uh, you know, they're sort of marching to get uh, community activism about doing a better job for TB. So again, we're expecting the results early next year. So we won't be formally presenting any data this year at this conference, but as we get data, we'll be presenting it, you know, perhaps at the International AIDS meeting in Australia next summer or at various conferences. Now, let me just say, take a step backwards a little bit to our approach for doing clinical trials and developing new drugs for TB. This is sort of an outline of our development paradigm. Remember I mentioned that while you may have a new individual drug or two that are active to treat TB, to really treat TB you need a regimen, which means more than one drug, so three or four drugs together. And ideally, we'd like to have, say, three all new drugs where there's no resistance of the bacteria to them any place and put them all together. What we're doing is down on the bottom, trying to take those drugs and after the initial safety testing and healthy volunteers, put them together and move them forward rather than developing what, you know, taking, say, delaminid or bedaquiline, developing it for years to get its approval, then you develop another one. And then finally, you put them together. So it's sort of a new approach, which at least the Food and Drug Administration in the United States and a number of academic groups have been very encouraging in taking this approach so we can more quickly get a regimen uh, out. And then, again, here's just a little bit more on why new novel regimens. As we've said, we need shorter, simpler, safer treatments. We like to have a regimen where you don't have to test people and say, oh, you're drug sensitive or you're drug resistant, you know, you're four months treatment, you're 18 months treatment, but basically everybody can be treated the same way. And particularly for the drug resistant, the MDR uh, patients, you know, we want something that will be much faster, cheaper, easier, not interacting with the AIDS medicines. And again, for the healthcare systems, you know, to be able to deliver these in a, an easy way that's not so complicated. So I have just a few on, you know, how I and my colleagues actually work at these sites to develop a new drug, which may give you a little background as you hear some of the other presentations the next three days. We talked a little bit about the, the phases of drug development. So you go from discovery on the left, so it's just in the laboratory, in petri dishes with cultures, then you go into animals, preclinical, then you go into the clinic, so phases one, two, three. What the numbers show is the ones that don't make it, the, the, the drugs, the molecules that sort of die along the way for various reasons. 
So you might start with 50 where you're doing a lot of testing in the laboratory to get one approved drug out at the end. And this goes for many areas of drug development. So developing diabetes drugs, developing lots of different things. Um, but you can see it's a tremendous investment. So often it's seven to 10 go into humans for the first time just to get one approved. It may turn out there are safety problems or it may turn out they just get eliminated from the body so fast that you know, you'd have to take a pill every hour, which you can't do. We're always looking for drugs and regimens so that they can be taken by mouth, nothing injected, once a day. Um, I mean, if, if one could be taken once a week, that would be okay, but we don't want anything complicated. Not twice a day. Um, so that makes it a little tougher to get ones that, that work that way. But this is just sort of a general idea of the, the phases of drug development. So now to study drugs in TB patients, we have to go where the TB is. So this happens to be the, the Kybera community in uh, Nairobi, which um, has the vibrant community. There's a lot of TB there. And our Remox site, run by Camry, which you, you, you from, probably know from Kenya, um, they actually developed a clinic and a laboratory right in the community there. Uh, and we have community engagement leaders who, you know, if somebody doesn't show up for their clinic visit, they know exactly where they live and they'll run and try to encourage them to come. Um, this is a man actually from Kenya that I saw and took care of about three years ago. He, his wife had died of TB about two years previously. He came in losing weight, coughing. He actually was confused. I think it was because he didn't have enough oxygen in his brain. We all examined him, took his x-ray, and that was his x-ray. And this is pretty classic for TB. So what he has is sort of on, on that side is sort of a patchy pneumonia. Uh, it's supposed to be nice and clear with just some very fine lines. And then on this side, he, on, on the other side, he has cavities. Those are just big black holes with essentially no lung tissue in them. And then the white area, I don't know, there, there. That's consolidation, so that's just solid fluid and inflammatory cells. So there's not a lot of his lung that's actually putting oxygen in his blood. So he's, he's worse than most, but that might be what a patient comes in, they have to you know, understand the research study, sign consent, and then what we're watching is how much bacteria for TB is in the sputum, the thick mucus that people cough up. So you can imagine when he wakes up in the morning, he's just coughing up all this thick stuff. And then that has to go to the laboratory. Well, for, first of all, actually, let me show you. OK. Once he gets into the study, um, we have to have the medicines very carefully laid out. So this is a medication card that in the Remox study somebody would be taking. And believe it or not, this is just one week of therapy because they're blinded, meaning they take, some people take active drugs, some people take placebo, but we have to match all the actives and placebos, and it gets pretty complicated, but we try to make it easy. So, you know, day one, day two, day three, but that's some of the complexity and expense of doing the studies. So once somebody's coughed up some sputum, though, to know that they have TB to be enrolled in the study, you know, the classic diagnostic test is the microscope and a, a stained smear. It's a hundred-year-old test. Robert Koch in the late 1800s described TB as one of the first infectious diseases. Um, and the little red things, you know, they call it acid-fast bacteria. It's because when you do the staining and you put acid on it, it, they don't wash off. They stick to the slide. That's what acid-fast means. So a technician or a, a scientist, you know, will look um, find that and say, ah, we're pretty sure that's TB. Then some would go to be cultured, where they go into a, a, a broth liquid culture, and it will take a couple of weeks to actually grow out and see that that's TB. And what we'll do is, in the beginning of a research study, while people are taking the medicines, every week they'll cough up sputum and get a new culture done. And then maybe after the first month, then it'll go to every month so we can track what's happening until they're completely clear and month after month are not coughing up any more sputum that has the TB bacteria. 
This is what a culture plate looks like. So if we want to quantify how much TB bacteria is in somebody's sputum, they'll cough it up, it's dissolved, and then it's diluted out. So like a 1 to 10 dilution, a 1 to 100 dilution, and it's plated out, and then they can actually count. These are called colony forming units, or CFUs. So that came from one tuberculosis bacteria that now has grown out. So a technician can count, on this side they might count, I don't know, 25 colony forming units, on this side they might count 37. Take the average of it and you can follow that over time. So again, now let me go back into some of the regimens and show you some of the results. So in our what we call new combination 001. This was looking at this PA, PAMZ, PAA24, moxifloxus, and pyrazinamide regimen. First, we looked at it in NCO1 just for a two week period of time because we, we didn't know how well it would work in people. And if it didn't work well, you didn't want to keep somebody not getting good therapy for longer than two weeks. So the initial studies tend to be only two weeks long. What we did find, though, is that it killed 99% of all the bacteria in two weeks in the patients, which was actually better than the standard, what we call HRZE, that four drug regimen of isoniazid, rifampin, ethambutol, and uh, pyrazinamide. So that was NCO1, and it leads to NCO2. At the bottom, again, what the hope is, is that for drug-sensitive patients, this will be a four-month treatment, but patients with multi-drug resistance, this could be initially, say, a six-month treatment, which is a huge improvement with three oral drugs over, uh, you know, the current therapy that's, you know, six months of injections and 18 months of drugs. So that would cut back, you know, weight cut back the cost. And this is, just, I think you'll have access to these slides later. Too, but it shows you know going from over 12,000 pills to 360 pills over the course of treatment, no injections. Um, this, the, this is the way we show results, and at some of the, the uh, presentations in the next couple of days, you'll see this, and that's why I showed you a little bit of the background of what on the, the Petri dish culture plates it looks at. So um, these lines, and see my pointer. At any rate, the lines show the reduction in colony forming units counted. Now these are log reductions. So each, each on, on the left hand side, the y axis, each minus one on the scale is a tenfold reduction. So a two log reduction is a nine, you know, like a 99% reduction of the bacteria. Now, don't worry about, the, the, these are all the different regimens we test, and don't worry about all the details, but Rifafor is the brand name of the standard HRZE combination that's used in South Africa and a number of countries. So this Rifafor is the standard therapy that if I got sick with TB in Paris and went to the hospital, that's what I would be given. And you can see the reduction over 14 days. So each day, sputum's collected, it's cultured, it's plated out. They count up the number of those colony forming units. This is what Rifafor did, which is pretty good. This is what PAMZ did, which was much better. Um, uh, so this was about a two and a half log reduction as opposed to about a uh, you know, one, one and a half log reduction. So that gave us the encouragement and enthusiasm to go to a two-month study, which is NCO2, which has just been finished up. Um, NCO2, I'm not going to show a lot about because we, we don't really have the results to be able to present yet. We're just in the process of getting the results. So that took this PAMZ regimen for two months and it enrolled patients with both drug-sensitive and drug-resistant TB. As they were enrolled, we did check their cultures to be sure they were sensitive to moxifloxacin and to pyrazinamide because those are older drugs. Some people have resistance to them. But of the ones sensitive, again, we enrolled them and we're just in the process of looking at um, the results. The, um, you know, the very early results are very encouraging that it looks good and it looks like something we want to take into phase three into a, a full 
study, but we're just in the process of making that decision. Now, the other study is NCL03, so that's new combination 003. This is looking at completely different combinations of drugs, ones that in mouse studies, when mice with TB are treated, can treat them in as little as, say, two months of therapy. Now, we don't know whether two months in a mouse is going to translate into two months in humans, but these are the same mouse studies that if you use the standard HRZE therapy, you have to treat a mouse for six months to cure the TB so it doesn't come back. Now we've got regimens that go down to maybe two months in the mouse. They have to be studied in humans to know whether that's going to translate. But again, it's encouraging. Um, this study is going to be presented Saturday morning, so the details will be then. I, yeah, you can come, come hear that. Um, but it includes bedaquiline. So in this case, it's bedaquiline in people with drug-sensitive as well as drug-resistant TB, PA-24, pyrazinamide, and then there's an older drug, clofazamine. Has anyone heard of clofazamine? Or lamprine is the uh, brand name. It's an old drug used for um, leprosy. So it's a great drug for people with severe leprosy, but as you can imagine, not many people in the world have been treated with it, and only recently people have started to use it for tuberculosis because they've found, again, in some mouse models that it can be helpful, but we really don't have much scientific information to know whether it works very well. Excuse me? Yes. I hope you don't mind if I interrupt you. Sure, good. Just listening to the complexity of this, uh, where does all the money come from? Because you're not driven by an expectation of making billions from your drug sales. Sure. It, is it mostly your donors, or it sounds like a very complicated thing to finance? Well, it, it is, and that's where, you know, we've been really encouraged, like the TV Alliance as a public-private partnership, is that the money comes from a whole variety of sources. So there are donor funds, so the Gates Foundation is a big one, um, as well as um, USAID, the British government, the Australian government. But we do get contribution of a lot of help from, say, drug companies. So. For example, Johnson & Johnson that has been developing bedaquiline, if we put it into a trial, you know, they give us the drug free. We don't have to pay for it. They also give a lot of support and other advice. In the Remox study, the original maker of moxifloxacin is Bayer Pharmaceutical, the German company. And as we're putting together regulatory files, you know, which is a lot of work, I mean, they have 10 or 20 people at Bayer are working to help us. So it's not money, but it's people time. So it's sort of leverage, as well as uh, the National Institutes of, of Health, which are funded by US taxpayers. They actually have done uh, three studies of these drugs um, to look at whether there are any effects on the heart or drug interactions. So what it is is, you know, the donors cover a lot of the costs, but then we leverage a lot of other support from drug companies, from the you know, NIH, the US government, others. And that's, it's an exciting model. So it makes something happen, and hopefully we like to think we do it in a more efficient way maybe than some drug companies might. Um, but it is a very complicated, expensive process. It, I'm, I'm gonna finish out with just a little bit on the pediatric program and we can go into more questions, but any more questions on these type of trials? So pediatric TB, a lot of groups have recognized that we don't do a very good job treating pediatric TB, and you, you may have heard about it in one of the previous talks, but a lot of children just don't get diagnosed. Um, even if they cough and have it in their lungs, they don't cough up sputum in the same way. So often you have nothing under the microscope to look at. Sometimes kids will have what we call scrofula, which is TB in a lymph node, or scrofula derma. It's, it's in the skin where you can put a little needle in, and pull back, and put it on a slide and see TB. But a lot of kids, there's just kind of nothing to test. So it's a tough diagnosis to make. Then kids that are diagnosed, um, again, it's the same thing. They need to be treated for six months if they have drug-sensitive TB, or 18 to 30 months if they have drug-resistant TB. 
But what we've found is the WHO has made in, in 2010 new recommendations on the dosing. So you've got the four standard drugs, you know, which we, HRZE are the, the shorthand for it. You have to get the dose right. So like, let's say it's 50 milligrams per kilogram for a child. But also, ideally for a child or an adult, you'd like to put them together in one pill, a fixed dose combination. But you have to put it together in the right ratios for a child, which may be different for an adult. As it turns out, no manufacturer right now is making a fixed dose combination in the right combinations for children. So, let me just see the next slide. Yeah. So, can you see the picture? What What's wrong with this picture? There are a couple things not good about it. If you're just breaking down these medicines, which are meant for adults, and giving them to children. Exactly. That's that. Those are adult pills. Some sometimes they're crushed. Sometimes they're broken. But can you imagine it? I mean, it's complicated. You may not get it right. Um, does that look like an accurate half of a tablet there? <laughs> not really. Um, and the other thing, what, what if that's a two-year-old child? How's he going to take that? You know, it's not a so form. These are actually kid-friendly medicines. No, they're not. Um, so ideally what you want is the medicine, ideally all in a fixed dose combination so you don't have to deal with the different pills. Ideally in something that we might call a dispersible form, so like a little sachet of powder, and it may be for a lightweight child, it's, it's one little packet of powder, for a heavier child it's two, and for the heaviest it's three, and beyond that you go on to adult doses. And the idea is that you could sprinkle it over some food or mix it up in a little bit of juice and give it to them. That's really what you want. So as you can read that, you know, there are no really safe appropriate, and this is just for the old drugs, not even the new drugs. Hard to dose correctly. I was in Peru and Lima visiting one of the very good national TB sites and the nurses were talking about with the children how they'll take like for one child a whole week's worth of adult pills for the week, put them in a uh, mortar and pestle, crush them up, and then try to divide them into seven days. And they know that it's really hard to be accurate that way. And you know, we don't even know whether the drugs um, are, are compatible sitting for a week all together when they're done that way. Um, also, the real young children, so five kilograms, which would be maybe uh, 12 pounds in the United States, um, you know, young ones, they have TB, but there are really no studies or no recommendations. It's just a guess what to give them. And for new treatments, again, fortunately, Otsuka and Johnson & Johnson are working hard to develop pediatric formulations and do pediatric studies. But, you know, usually for, for most drugs, and certainly for TB drugs, it's many years from the time the adult gets on the market to children. Now, some of that is necessary. You know, you really have to know it's safe in adults before you start treating little children, but we need better ways. So at the TB Alliance, we've gotten funding from a, a European group called Unitaid, and it's us working with the World Health Organization on a new pediatric initiative. And the first part of it is to just find manufacturers, get incentives, so these fixed dose combinations in a dispersible sachet can be developed. But then it's also to work with regulatory authorities around the world to have a good efficient path so that a new drug can be studied in children quickly and efficiently and not take five to seven years. So the whole idea is speeding treatments to end TBs. So I mean a lot of it is just engaging manufacturers. So whether it's India or other places that have good manufacturers that make high quality, low cost drugs, you know, they have to know that there's a market out there to sell it, that they're at least gonna make enough money to, to do the production. Um, we have to know the market better too, you know, who's going to use it, how many children in different countries, of what ages, a lot of that's just not known. You know, we're working on engaging countries and donors, um, and again, as I said, regulatory understanding. So if you put these four drugs together into one, well, tablet for adults or, or a, a sachet, a powder, 
for children, you know, what are the types of studies in humans you have to do to show that you're giving them the same thing as if you give them each one individually. And then this is kind of a timeline. I'm not going to spend much time on it, but um, it's something over the next four years we've sort of outlined the progress for what are the steps we can take to get a lot, lot better drugs out for children. And it's really exciting working in partnership with, um, uh, with WHO on this. So this is, this is really the last slide, and these are some of the symposia. Now the first three sort of have already happening or are happening today. The FIND is the diagnostics group workshop, which is actually going on right now and finishes at 5 o'clock. Um, so here are three others. Uh, Multidrug resistant TB in children and adolescents. So tomorrow there's a whole session on that that will go a lot more into the pediatric needs. Saturday, as I mentioned, 8 to 10, it's both us, me, talking about NCO03, that study, but it's also a number of different colleagues talking about drug trials and things that have been tested. And then more on this Unitaid-sponsored pediatric initiative is on Saturday. And I think people mentioned there are other groups presenting things about drugs at other times. So somebody mentioned um, Jansen, I think, is talking about vidacoline. Is it Sunday? I was just looking it up. It's either Saturday. Or it's a late breaker. So oh, it's a late breaker. OK. And again, you'll have to look through the. Um, but that's basically what I wanted to cover. It, it's more sort of an idea of how do we develop drugs, the excitement. There, there are new things, but we still need, need better things. But it's a better time um, than ever. And you know, I just feel so privileged and fortunate myself to be able to work with this sort of at this point in history when we've actually got something to work with. So let me see if there are, we've got a few more minutes, you know, any other questions I can help with? Yes? I had a disagreement yesterday with a lady from Medicines on Frontier, if that's how it's pronounced. Yeah. She was claiming that the first step towards uh, faster development of drugs and cheaper drugs was for the pharmaceutical companies to open up their books and admit that the drugs don't cost as much as they claim. Would you agree that I was right to say she has no idea what she's talking about? <laughs> so her idea was basically just drop the prices of drugs. No, show us how much the real cost. Oh, the real cost. She says they are hiding the real cost <laughs> in their books. And the cost that they said. Yes, the cost of produ uh, research and of the production. Yes, research and development. Production is or oh, development. development. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, because I mean, certain drugs actually do cost a fair amount to produce because there are a lot of chemical synthetic steps and that sort of thing. Um, a typical drug, though, the high price when it first comes on the market, is because they're having to recoup all the investment. You know, the incredible expense it took to develop it. Um, again, I can't speak for, I know, you know, one example, I, I know some of the MSF or the activists have been critical, say, of Sanofi about the price of rip, rifapentin. And again, I can't speak for them or anything about it. Um, yeah, our approach, again, is with our partners to make them as affordable and available as possible. So the fact that things we're developing are being done with Gates Foundation money and USAID money and that sort of thing, you know, we don't have to charge a price to recoup that. It's all in the public interest. On the other hand, whoever man, you know, we don't have a manufacturing facility. So if we have an Indian manufacturing facility, um, you know, they have to get paid enough to make it worthwhile to manufacture, but that's going to be much, much less than a typical drug. Um, so, yeah, yeah, I'm not sure I have a good answer for you. <laughs> well, it's an unfair question in a way, but... Well, you know, it, it goes for almost any drug, you could say. I mean, if a drug company sold everything they developed for just the pure cost of making it in a factory, nobody would develop drugs anymore. You know, you just wouldn't have drugs developed. I think the nice thing, though, with this idea of public-private partnerships, so there are other organizations, like one's called DMDI, Drugs for Neglected Disease Initiatives. 
They're developing drugs for African trypanosomiasis sleeping sickness and Chagas disease. There's no money in that. So that's another one where the Gates Foundation, other groups are putting money into it so you can develop something that will be affordable. So again, I, I think that's one takeaway is, is rather than beat on drug companies to do something their investors probably aren't going to let them do, is to promote these kind of public-private partnerships, which includes a lot of goodwill of drug companies that you know want to help out and do something good. Um, but it's done in a very, in, in sort of a win-win way for everybody. Maybe I'll leave it at that emphasis. <laughs> uh, is there one more question? Anybody? Well, thank, thank you. Thank you it's, so much. I appreciate your interest in this. Thanks a lot.